morning. Good morning. Okay, so I think we are good to start. So first of all, um, I would like to invite Rosa and uh, tell us about bioengineering and its application and uh, problems in astrobiology. So Rosa, over to you. Thank you, Avia. Hello, everyone. Hi, nice to see you all. I am talking to you right now uh, from Bremen, Germany. And um, it's a nice afternoon, a little sunny, but mostly cloudy as it is in most uh, European countries. And I will be talking about a very interesting topic. Um, if I can share my screen. Oh, I need to stop sharing. I think I need to share my screen. Yes. Okay. Um, you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll just close our cameras and present. Okay, so um, as I said, I am Rosa. Uh, I am a biochemist, uh, which is ba which basically means I'm doing biology and chemistry at the same time. And I am currently studying in Bremen, Germany, and uh, it's a nice afternoon. And today we're gonna have a nice, fun lecture in association with uh, YSB ASK program. And we're gonna talk about how genetic engineering can um, potentially further our astrobiology research. And Rimshe is gonna talk about how uh, robotics technology or robots or cyborgs can uh, enhance our astrobiology research. So before I start, uh, Okay, good stuck. Yes, before we start and uh, to give everyone some time to uh, join as well, make sure that your phone and computer is charged and ready. If you want, maybe get some snacks or drinks because we're gonna be working together for a little bit of time. And uh, I, do don't, I don't want you to be, you know, uh, thirsty or unentertained. So I think snacks can help with that. And of course, don't forget to bring in your creativity because this is all about thinking outside of the box as most of science is. So I'm gonna give everyone maybe two minutes just to make sure um, to get ready. Um, meanwhile, maybe, you know, we can talk among ourselves. Does anyone uh, want to introduce themselves? Where are you guys all joining us from? My name is Brenna. Hi, um, Brenna. I'm really interested. I think my future career is probably going to be a neurologist, um, but I'm really interested in astrobiology and learning about space. And I'm tuning in from Ontario, Canada. Hi, nice. So what time is it there, Brenna, now? It's about nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, nice. Good morning to you then. Thanks. And I think neurology is a very developing part of astrobiology because you, um, you will learn or you will see later that when it comes to neurons, we honestly don't know a lot when it comes to how they developed, you know, how how they became so differentiated from the, you know, the general cell. So it's a really interesting uh, field to go into, I think, if you decide to merge the two. <laughs> I'm also in Ontario. Oh, Weston, right? Yes. Nice, Weston. And um, are you also thinking a career later in uh, astrobiology or? I have always thought about um, an engineer at SpaceX. 
Oh, cool. So you want to work for Elon Musk? Huh? Yeah, hence my starship background. Oh, cool, 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 cool. So we have a lot of engineers and um, let's say biologists, because I, I would like to think biology also f focuses on neuroscience a lot among us. Anyone else? Ooh, I can go next. Yeah, um, hi, Aya. Aria, um, and I am calling in from Los Angeles, California. And for me, I haven't really figured out my future career path yet, but I know I would love to do something in the STEM field, especially. And my favorite um, so far has been astrobiology. So maybe something in that career field. That's really cool. That's really cool. And what time is it in California right now? Um, it's a little bit past 6 a.m. Cool. So you woke up at 6 a.m. for this. Wow. That's a lot of <laughs> pressure. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm excited. Nice. I'm excited. And that was really nice to hear. I, I mean, uh, of course, there are a lot of good astrobiology programs all around U.S. and the world. but. Um, I know, I think Caltech has a great program that sort of uh, focuses on the molecular evolution of things, which is my field, that's why I know. But yeah, that's, that's really cool. I hope, you know, I can keep you guys interested um, or enhance your interests with this uh, slide as well. Okay, so we talked for three minutes and we're gonna do a lot of activities as well. So I'm not gonna spend more time. I hope you guys got some snacks, some uh, drinks and you're charged and ready to go. Okay, let's go. So our plan for today uh, is that I'll be talking about superpowers and how you can get them. And Rimsha is gonna be talking about robots and how you can become one. So right away, we have a tiny little icebreaker for everyone joining as well. Uh, please go to menti.com and use this code. I will also open the page here. So this will be the first one. Okay, so it's not that. Okay, so please go to menti.com and use this code. Ooh, someone already, <laughs> someone already added their answer. And please answer the question, what would be your superpower if you had one? Cool okay, wow, cool, cool, cool. Okay, but I'm gonna give you like three more minutes. Healing, that's nice. Okay, okay, a lot of cool ones. <laughs> Someone said to blow eyes. Would you like to elaborate whoever said to blow eyes? What would that indicate? Okay. 
flying, flying, yeah. Immortality, okay. That's very possible. Speed. Mm -hmm. To be super strong. Ooh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. They're, they're still coming in. Ooh, okay. Underwater breeding. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. Survival of any place. Ooh, okay. Keep that in mind because actually we're going to talk about that or something very similar in Rimshas Park. And we have control over the elements. Someone wants to be avatar. I can relate to that. Um, electricity is, yeah, I think I saw that before. So um, the way this works is the bigger words mean that a lot of people actually um, stated something similar. So the four most common uh, superpowers that we want is teleportation, strength, healing, and shape-shifting. Um, from a genetic standpoint, I think we can definitely work with strength, maybe healing, but not other people, but like, you know, faster healing for yourself. Shape-shifting, <laughs> I would have to think about that in a, a you know, more scientific sense. I don't know if that's, that would be possible, but the top three are definitely possible. Okay, so since we've filled our three minutes, I'm going to go to the next question. And that is, is it possible to have superpowers in real life? So can, if you guys could vote yes or no. Okay, yes. Already two people said yes. Let's see. Oh, okay. I guess I gave too many clues, right? Yes, everyone is saying yes. That's nice to hear. I have a lot of gen genetic engineers in the group. That's very promising. Okay, one more minute, let's see. Is anyone gonna say no? No one is saying no. I love that. Okay. Okay, no one is saying no. That's great. Perfect. That means you guys all believe in genetic engineering and that's really promising. So we're going to talk about how that works. So, as we just said, the main four ones were healing, uh, teleportation, shape-shifting, and intellect. Oh, it became intellect now. Okay, cool, cool. That also is something we can work with. Let's see. So, in order to be able to talk about genetic engineering and, um, you know, how we can gain superpowers. Oh, before I go ahead, by the way, if you have any pressing questions, you can just stop me at any time. I do not mind. Just unmute yourself and start speaking because I'm, I can't see the chat. I hope uh, that's okay. Okay, so before we start talking about how we can have superpowers, first, we need to understand what we have in our hands, uh, what nature provides us. So we have something called DNA that a lot of genetic engineers or almost all of us used to edit and change and manipulate for our purposes. But what is DNA? In very basic terms, DNA is what carries all the information about how a living thing will look and function. Your DNA exists within all of your cells. It carries all of the information that is necessary to make you, specifically you. So my DNA is different from yours because my DNA carries information that is necessary to make me, how I look like, to make my brown hair, my brown eyes, maybe 
to make me as tall as I am. And your DNA carries the information that is to make you. And our cells carry that information and use DNA and that information to make specific proteins, right? And those proteins later in turn result in certain features, certain phenotypes like a round face or a square face or a brown hair or yellow hair, right? And um, in some cases, since we have neuroscientists in our group, in some cases, it might even result in some behavioral changes, but that's very specific and we'll go into that later. So what is genetics? We said DNA is within cell and cells make up our organisms by producing certain proteins, right? Genetics is the science of heredity, or in other words, the science of DNA. We try to understand how DNA, a specific uh, DNA, is passed down from parents to child, and how it's passed down from a cell to another cell when it replicates. We try to understand how a certain gene in a DNA results in a certain type of cell, and how that certain type of cell results in a certain type of organism with certain features. So if we were to look at the scheme, we could say genetics is basically these arrows right here, these pink arrows. Genetics is what sort of tries to understand the um, relationship between all these three nodes. Okay. Next activity. So as I said, we gain certain features by, um, by, from our DNA, from our parents. And certain things we learn from our world, like playing basketball, riding a bike, or maybe speaking a certain language, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and send a link to our chat for you guys to play this game with me. So this is the link and here is our chat. If it pops up. <laughs> okay. You can find the link for this game in the chat. Oh, there's a lot of conversation going on. Oh, it's great. <laughs> okay, a lot of fun conversation that I missed, which I'm kind of sorry about. But um, I hope you guys are here now in this uh, website and we play, click on play and let's do an example. Here you can see stars all around the image. So each star is sort of like a riddle you have to solve, okay? Let's uh, first explain what is nature and what is nurture. So there are a lot of different traits that makes you who you are. We talked about this. Your DNA contains specific information that is specific to make you, such as your eye color or your height, maybe you know certain genetic dispositions. These are made up almost entirely by your genes. And we call that traits of nature. You just inherit, inherit those traits from your parents. Other traits like the language you speak or you know, the way you behave around other people, how you socialize, how you play certain games, they come from through a combination of nature, again, from your genes, your cap physical capabilities, and your nurture, everything in your life that surrounds you, your community, your environment, your people, your parents, or sometimes even where you're just simply ending up. So most scientists think that both nature and nurture play, play important roles in who we are, but certain things just depend on your genes. 
in this game is about solving what type of traits are the product of both nature and nurture and what type of traits are just nature so just your genes let's do an example so i'll click on this star since sam's family speaks spanish at home he's equally good at spanish and english you could say he's a bilingual bicyclist is this trait due to nature or both nature and nurture? So who would like to answer? I'm listening. Nature and nurture, I think. Uh, why, Brenna? Because he grew up listening to Spanish mm -hmm. um, and his parents gave him, so that's the nurture part, and his parents gave him the right genes to be able to speak Spanish and English well enough together. Perfect. That is correct. It is due to nature and nurture, like Brenna said, because the genetic ability to talk, to, you know, uh, have uh, your larynx, your mouth move a certain way, or your brain have the certain place to register um, speaking, that would be your nature, the genetics part. And then like Brenna said, her, his parents or their parents taught them how to speak a specific language. So that's why it's both nature and nurture. I'm gonna give you um, maybe five, six minutes um, to solve the genetic riddle all around if you're interested um, and I'll just be looking through the chat in case you have any questions or you can just unmute yourself and speak too. Yes, Dina, perfect. Exactly. You solved the riddle as well. So you didn't have to get all of them correct. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. You guys already knew all this. But I'm just I'm just so excited about the basics. Sorry if I'm just, you know, going over things that you already know. Okay, two more minutes and I think everyone will be done. Yeah, so Dina, right? You can speak the language, but you don't know the alphabet. That's because you weren't probably weren't exposed to reading Russian or
Oh, okay. So you were you you were reading okay. Uh huh. But I guess hmm, Russian alphabet. R Russian alphabet is completely uh, uh, Uyghur. Um, it's Uyghur alphabet, or my mistake. I. Okay, acrylic. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! So Fasi, you speak four languages. Jeez, that's that's really impressive. Wow. Okay. Okay. So we filled our time. Hopefully, now everyone has an idea as to how what is genetic and what is not necessarily genetic. Let's go ahead with our presentation. Okay, so what is genetic engineering though? Genetic engineering in the most basic sense is the artificial manipulation, modification and recombination of DNA. What does that mean? In very, very simple and not really scientific words, that basically is what this guy is doing right here. It's changing the places of the genes or changing the original ones with the different synthetic ones that humans made. You might think that, oh, okay, this is a very new scientific tool that we've developed to control our environment. And unfortunately, you would be wrong because we have been using genetic engineering for the past thousands and thousands of years. In fact, ever since humans ever started settling down and building villages and civilizations, that is, we started taking plant seeds that we liked and then specifically cultivating certain seeds and certain types of fruits, which led to an artificial reproduction of those strains and uh, a genetic manipulation of that specific species. I'm gonna show you an example of the original banana and the modern banana, and you will kind of get an idea as to what I'm saying. The more recent way of doing genetic engineering is doing actual DNA modifications through um, circular DNA vectors like these ones here to manipulate and change animal DNA for their phenotype, for their genotype, that means for their uh, outer looks or to prevent certain diseases or change their genes completely. Or sometimes we use such tools to develop certain organs or certain tissues to um, use for people who need those organs or who need a tissue replacement because they have severe burns. And in some cases, we're using these genetic tools to develop drugs and vaccines, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So before I go on to the next slide, I just want to highlight, you can see an example of a DNA here in a very basic scheme. As you can see, DNA has two strands. So the example we're going to talk about here is the COVID vaccine. So I'm sure you guys already heard a lot about this, but uh, BioNTech and Moderna and CureVac and many other COVID vaccines are using something very new called mRNA. mRNA is a single stranded nucleic acid molecule that also carries information regarding certain proteins. But the reason why we're using mRNA in this case, mRNA carries a concise and very accurate, almost let's say very accurate version of the gene. So using mRNA to produce a protein will be easier rather than having the DNA part of itself because then you would have to integrate that into someone's DNA. But for mRNA, for this single stranded molecule, it doesn't have to be integrated into someone's DNA and it's just in your cell and your cell can produce the proteins for your immune system to recognize. So COVID vaccine is actually uh, one of the fastest vaccines developed and it's sort of like, a, I don't know, one of the biggest achievements of genetic engineering in the past century. And 
Agriculture, as I talked about, is something we have been genetically modifying for the past hundreds and hundreds of years. You can see that this is the original banana right here. The original banana was way shorter, significantly more green with a thicker outer layer, and it had a lot of seeds in it, actually. So what we did as humans, we started specifically picking certain types of bananas to cultivate and produce because we liked those. We didn't like the ones that had seeds in them. We liked the ones that had less seeds in them. And that eventually led to bananas losing their seeds and looking like what they do today with um, their yellow thin skin and seedless inner layer. So these are two uh, very solid examples of how genetic engineering affects our daily lives and enhances it. But this is only 2020, or in this case, 2021. What is the future of genetic engineering? That's the, inter the interesting question. So before we go into a break, we're gonna talk about two things. Um, how does this genetic engineering could potentially relate to astrobiology? And what do superpowers have to do with all this that I've talked about. So I'm going to go to this mentee again. And I'm going to ask you to go to mentee.com again and use a different code this time. And that is the code 61037016. You can see here. So I'll go one slide back. Oh, I can't see the chat. Where is that? Tardy grades. Okay, fancy words. <laughs> Oh, you just got your vaccine. Congratulations. That's so cool. Okay, this chat is so nice to read through. You guys are so sweet. Okay, okay, let's see what you said. So you said life on other planets. Yes, the tardigrades. Okay, okay, really cool. What aliens look like, alien plants, aliens, mutated humans. Okay, who would like to explain what a tardigrade is? Since everyone seems to agree. Can I explain? Please go ahead, Benna. So a tardigrade is a microscopic um, animal that can pretty much live anywhere. It can live in the vacuum of outer space and survive. It can live on the moon and it can live in ice, literal ice. And I think everyone in this um, class loves tardigrades <laughs> because um, they are so different and unique, which makes it easier to understand what aliens could be like and what aliens could adapt to. That is, wow. You guys are amazing. That is exactly what I'm gonna talk about after the break. Not necessarily specifically tardigrades, um, but that's a very good example of what we need to understand in order to have um, exoplanet discoveries. But we're gonna talk about 
what we need to understand in Earth in order to engineer, like you said here, engineer an extraterrestrial or understand tardigrades and how we can develop them for specific exoplanets. But that's amazing. I was worried that no one was going to think about this, but you guys did. So next question, let's go. Okay, so what do superpowers have to do with genetic engineering? Someone said, we can change someone's DNA to cause their muscle mass to increase or to modify some physical or mental shape. Yes, exactly. We're going to see an example of that from Hollywood, um, which I kind of love that scene. Soon. Oh, I don't know why it doesn't let me see the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, Kai, you should be offended. <laughs> oh, perfect. So you guys have tardigrades as your mascot. Okay. I will never offend you. They are very cool. Modifying DNA to create artificial superpowers. Exactly. Mutated humans equals superpowers. You guys, you guys got it. You guys got it. We can understand how does life evolve like tardigrades. Yes, yes. And that's important because honestly, we don't know what life is right now because there is a fact that viruses exist right? And viruses are not alive, but they are carrying genetic factors and they can reproduce, although using a host, but they can still reproduce. So genetic engineering is crucial to understand how life works or what life is. Okay, mutated humans, mutated humans. Yes, we can create and engineer humans, animals, or maybe plants to be able to have godly powers. Okay, that sounded like an evil mastermind. I love it. Okay, I think that was enough. And I think everyone generally has great ideas. So we can continue. And I think we all now um, deserve a break because... I want you to think about um, possible movies that investigate genetic engineering and astrobiology. Okay. Hopefully. Okay. So we're going to take a small break of 10 minutes now. And I will see you in 347. I hope you guys will get us. Um, We'll get some snacks. Okay. See you in a bit. Okay. Yes, Kai. Uh, also, you guys can uh, ask me questions. I'll be here. That's, that's what some scientists believe. But then um what's harder is defining what's half living and what's full living <laughs> your mom would kill you okay well it is kind of living okay ah <laughs> right okay yeah it's very late for you maybe you can get water or i don't know if you need to go to the toilet but that's very late that is true um, it is kind of living, again, that's true, but when it comes to science, a lot of scientists need very concrete definitions. Definitions where sort of you can be, build theories from. And that's the problem with defining life, right? Because it needs to be a theory that defines every living thing uh, in Earth, and it also needs to define non-living things inside earth and outside earth that's that's the problem 
And uh, Brenna, the question is, I wanted you to think about um, a movie that sort of investigated um, genetic engineering and astrobiology or molecular evolution. Or uh, yeah, in general, movies that have genetic engineering stuff. I mean, all superhero movies, yeah. Yeah, that's, I was gonna say, that's a good example, right? Um, what's yours, Arya? Um, I'm not actually sure if this counts, but I think so, as I remember. I haven't watched this movie in a few years. Um, I think it was called Avatar. Um, these humans were able to go into these machines and like replicate these things in their minds, I think. Um, oh wait, when you said Avatar, I thought about the blue thing, the blue Avatar stuff. Are you talking about yeah. the same movie? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. I think that will work exactly. Uh, it's it's a version of genetic engineering because they are developing like bodies, right? Bodies of this other species. Um, yeah, that's actually a good example that I never even thought about before. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Right? Yeah, that's that's really good. That's really good. So Fuzzy said Superman from space. That is very obvious. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's good. Volley. Volley. Which part of Volley? I think there's some point where they like talk about how they genetically engineer babies in the ship so they don't get diseases or something, but I don't remember very well. Do you have a, a part I, that's like in your mind, Brenna? Hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I get, now I get what you mean. Okay, yeah, that works. As they got, okay. Yeah. And John says Captain America. That's that's my example. I always uh, think about the scene where, you know, in the very first movie, he's very thin and weak. And then they sort of genetically engineer him and then he becomes the, you know, superhero. That's the that's actually such a strong uh, achievement in a sense that even today, right? Uh, we are um, genetically engineering babies and like we can genetically engineer non-developed uh, creatures, but we can't genetically engineer developed multicellular organisms. So like in that movie, they're already taking a developed guy and then genetically engineering him out of nowhere. Uh, someone said it's super soldier serum, exactly, right? And then I always like, that's the biggest thing. If we can't figure out how to genetically engineer someone who's already born and developed, then yeah, back in World War II, exactly, exactly. But like, it's insane. If we had that achievement in World War II, I think we would be, living in a different planet by now but that, that's insane yes aria that's that's so true and actually we're going to talk about that too because that's something that i'm also very interested in right because yeah genetic engineering has a lot of elements like we talked about but what if they go into the wrong hands like you said hmm yeah, okay. That is possible. We can also genetically engineer cells. Um, but that's not, I mean, we could do that, right? I don't know if you heard about the uh, scientist in China. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. They usually take it to another level, which, you know, sort of... Uh, scares you out of uh, nowhere but also there is something to talk about who gets to edit a human DNA right 
like Arya said, what if it's someone with not the best of intentions? That's, that's I think, the problem with genetic engineering in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, a bad comedian with who can't die. Yeah, exactly. I actually like that poll. I mean, I didn't mean to bad comedian, but you know. Yeah, that's so true. Okay. Two more minutes, guys. Okay. Good point, Quinn. Only doctors can edit. But then, I mean, I don't know. I have met bad doctors as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, the issue, I guess, is not everyone trusts doctors or scientists. And this is too much power. So if someone doesn't feel comfortable, even only one person, it's kind of hard to justify doing it. Although you can argue, you know, gene editing technology can prevent genetic diseases. <laughs> yes, they perform. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Okay. Then if we become genetic engineers, then we only genetically edit our uh, children or ourselves if we can that that's a good idea i like it <laughs> okay i think i can start um let's <laughs> yes okay perfect since um, Arya got her snack and everyone is in the mood, let's go ahead. Now I want oatmeal cake. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I'll make myself some after this. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about the future of genetic engineering. I think it got stuck again. Yeah. Okay. So genetics, all this that we've talked about, helps us understand the past better. And what do I mean by that? I mean, using the modern DNA data available from humans, from animals, from plants, from bacteria, we can actually trace back our ancestors in the evolutionary tree. So genetics or our DNA information helps us understand better our previous ancestor and the ancestor before that, and then the ancestor before that, and potentially understand how we actually relate to chimpanzees and um, you know other mammals in general. And at the end, if we go back and back and back in millions of years ago, genetics actually helps us understand Luca much better. And Luca is our last universal common ancestor. So we believe, based on the theory of evolution, that every single living thing, organism, and maybe potentially even viruses, come back to this one organism called last universal common ancestor, where we all evolved from. The thing with LUCA is we don't have any necessary concrete information as to what it was, how it looked, where it lived. So we use genetic information of uh, very old archaea or very old bacteria or very unevolved unicellular organisms to sort of trace back ourselves back to LUCA. So what we know currently about LUCA is that it was probably a multi-nuclei organism. So it had multiple nucleus, multiple DNA groups in one cell. And it had a lot of different organelles in their very primitive forms. 
and potentially it lived in very, very hot places that would facilitate cellular function and certain chemical reactions. So Luca lived, or last universal common ancestor lived billions and billions and billions of years ago. And today we separate life, um, organisms, let's say, not life, uh, we separate organisms into three specific groups. There is archaea, there's bacteria, and eukaryotes. Us as humans, plants, and animals, all complex cells be belong in the eukaryotic group. So why would we need to understand last universal common ancestor and how we can understand last universal common ancestor? We would have to understand last universal common ancestor to understand life, how life evolved. And we need to understand how previous forms of life survived. Like in the movie, Jurassic Park, we can use the information of our ancestors to potentially recreate animals or organisms in general from the past that are already gone extinct. As you know, because of human activity, a lot of organisms are going extinct today and they are endangered. We can use genetic information to potentially recreate these species and bring them back to life, like in Jurassic Park. But how does this relate to Luca? So potentially recreating our ancestors would allow us to understand Luca better. And at some point, it would allow us to understand how life began, how it initially evolved. We have some idea right now, but we're still missing puzzle pieces and recreating older versions of organisms uh, or older ancestors we, would allow us to understand life much better. And understanding life is important because if we understand life, we can create life from scratch. If we understand the elements that were needed to start life, to create life, to first initially form Luca, the last universal common ancestor, we can sort of form a little care package, a little life package, and send it to exoplanets to cultivate them with life, to colonize them with life without having to send a human being. Because as you all know, a lot of planets that can potentially cultivate life like Earth are really, really, really far away. They're millions of years of light years away. So we can't really send a human being in a ship there because I mean, unless we develop the technology, we're too slow. And that person would have to live and die and reproduce there and their next generation would have to reproduce. And most likely the close, closest exoplanet we can reach would have to see the 35th generation colonizing there. But if we understand how life works from scratch to begin with, we can just put all the elements, put all the chemicals, all the reactions necessary in one little package, put it in a robot or put it in a potential rocket and send it to an exoplanet to cultivate life from there. And that is how genetic engineering actually relates to um, astrobiology. It allows us to understand our evolution and potentially recreate life in exoplanets. And genetic engineering, as we've talked about, relates to superpowers because most people before 18th century, when a huge genetic breakthrough happened, had to have these sores on their face, on their skin, all over their body. But after this scientific breakthrough, people no longer suffer from these sores in most of the, um, most of the world because Edward Jenner developed a vaccine against smallpox. And this vaccine was used uh, first in 1792 and has been used ever since then. I mean, at least for most people. And this allows us to prevent smallpox, uh, not just treat, but 
prevent it from infecting our bodies. That's a huge feat in medical research. That means we can stop certain diseases even before they affect the human population, like smallpox, like polio, like Spanish flu, and many, many more diseases. This is a some type of superpower. Without genetic engineering, without scientific breakthroughs, we would still, a significant portion of our population would still have to go through all of these diseases, potentially shorten their lifespan. But now we have gained the superpower of, as someone said before, healing. We can heal and prevent ourselves from getting damaged. So as we talked about, we can enhance our bodies now against diseases, right? With vaccines, with treatments, we can prevent ourselves from shortening our lifespans. And we can also enhance our bodies against disabilities. We can have bionic arms, bionic legs, even some cases, bionic skeletons, right? But why would we stop there? And this is my favorite part. Potentially, future of humankind, as we've talked about it, involves a bio-revolution. You can talk, think about genetic uh, engineering sort of like plastic surgery. You can enhance the way you want to look with plastic surgery. And genetic engineering in the future potentially means you can enhance your mental capacity. You can enhance your child's um, fitness, their immunological responses, their strength, everything we've talked about so far. Not yet for fully developed humans, as I said. It's kind of hard to figure out how to genetically engineer an organism that's already developed. But now we know how to do this for mm, not so developed organisms. Um, I think we've already talked about this, but this is a good example of what can potentially happen in the future? Silman Fusion, beginning in five, four, three, two. Oh, got stuck. Oh, okay. One. Now, Mr. Stark. Stephen, can you hear me? Probably too late to go to the bathroom, right? We will proceed. That's ten percent. Thirty. That's forty percent. A lot of signs are normal. That's 50%. 60. 70. Stark! 
Son of a bitch did it. Okay, okay, perfect. Since we saw um, Captain America's um, super soldier body, I'm hoping I can escape this. Okay. Yes. Okay. I just have to see the chat. You guys are really funny. And I'm really curious as to what you're saying. Oh no, it doesn't let me see. Okay, never mind. I'll look at it in just a second. Okay, so as I said, it's impossible for us to genetically engineer an already developed organism like um, Steve Rogers here, as at least right now, it is possible for us to enhance our capabilities to a certain degree with genetic engineering. But as Arya mentioned before, we need to talk about if it's okay to change someone's DNA to begin with. So I'm again gonna go to uh, menti.com to see your comments on that. So it's this one. Let's talk about ethics, the, the most interesting and uh, discussion evoking part of science. Okay, so please go to menti.com and use the code 2022 And while you do that, I will read the chat. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is, so woolly mammoth, let's see how long it's their DNA, woolly mammoth, DNA length. Well, it already has a clone apparently. So it has 3.7 billion base pairs. Um, and that would, I think, take around um, a couple of months with the current technology we have, because the current synthesis technology we have is insanely cheap, especially con compared to the past and fast. So that would be pot possible in a couple of months. It's just the, the, the issue is which cell would be, uh, which egg, let's say, would be the accurate one to insert that DNA into. I would assume sort of like an elephant fetus or zygote, that would be, that would be a good example. Okay, so everyone is obsessed with Agent Carter. That's fun. <sighs> Human experiments, Captain America, <laughs> MCU is solid. <laughs> okay, nice, everyone. Dina, uh, Dina, we're uh, waiting for you to contribute to the ethical discussion. Oh, that's really cool. That's amazing, Kai. That's really cool. Okay, let's stop. So someone said no. That's very elaborative. Thank you. Someone said only if they have the full extent of the information on the procedure, procedure, risks, pain levels, and consequences. Humans can improve, but random experimenting to change ourselves could backfire hard. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know who wrote this, but the, if the author would like to, can you give us an example? Or maybe it's in the chat. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll look at the chat in just a second. Someone said, 
only for something that would help the future like tardigrades. Okay, I see that everyone loves tardigrades in this group. Okay. I don't know, is it, someone said. Well, I don't know. I was asking the question first. <laughs> someone said with consent, yes. As long as none is removed and no harmful genes are added, some powers and extra DNA would be fine. Okay. I guess there the question arises, what if some of the DNA um, leads to certain diseases, then is it okay to remove that DNA? Uh, that's initially there, I don't know. Yes, I would like everyone to be of the same height. Okay, I see someone is very sour about their height. But again, here, it, uh, the question arises where if everyone is on the same height, then there are certain advantages and disadvantages at being at a certain height. Would that be okay? Because being tall is advantageous to reach to certain places. And, you know, being short is much better when you're traveling with a plane. <laughs> so that's where that question comes from. I, uh, I think we yeah. also need biodiversity, right? So if we are all the same height, that is a loss of that Train. diversity in height. Yeah, yeah. That's very true. That's very true, Queen. And um, that's another problem where, for example, uh, there's a discussion going on, potentially it is possible to um, genetically uh, sort of stop uh, fetuses with Down syndrome from developing. And that would sort of put an end to the Down syndrome. But then there's a discussion. Do we sort of treat that as a disease or is it not necessarily a disease because people who advocate for down syndrome claim that it's not necessarily a disease not something that we need to eradicate from our lives right that's also another question it's the same with um, um growth disabilities a lot of people with growth disabilities are campaigning against um, genetic engineering groups who are preventing that type of um, genetic um, predisposition. So yeah, that's, that was, that's a really good point, Quinn. Do we, do we need to get rid of that trait? It's a good question. So the last one is, it depends. If someone wants, wants it, they can have it changed. If they don't, they won't have it changed. If they need it, they have it changed no matter their preference because their life needs it. That's another good point. The problem with that is if my kids are smarter than yours, then their um, success in life will be easy for them, right? So if, my, if I genetically engineer my kids and if you don't, then your kids are gonna be in disadvantage. That's the problem. So if you don't, then I shouldn't either because I can buy that advantage for my kids. That's where some of these issues come from. Yes, I think the baby does not have the ability to communicate, but maybe we can have their parents be representative since they have created the child. Yeah, I, I would assume if we were to change human DNA, we call these babies designer babies, by the way. Um, if we were to have designer babies, I guess then the representative would be their parents and their decision would be sort of permanent. Let's see the chat. Uh, someone raised the hand. Yes, uh, Manish, go ahead, please. If like the parent was the representative, um, how do they know that the child will hate them for like changing their DNA? Um, like I think rather you should like be able to change your DNA once like you actually have full extent of mm -hmm. all the consequences and everything. That's a really good point, right? So the you're saying child becomes an independent brain, uh, not a brain, 
independent person later on. So they shouldn't have to be subjugated to their parents' decision. Um, the problem with that, and that's a really good point, I think, is again, we don't know how to edit the DNA of a fully developed person, which is the problem. Um, if we could do that, I would agree with you, honestly. I think then it would be just a later in life sort of decision, sort of like plastic surgery. Uh, but yeah, that's a problem with genetic engineering. We can't really do that for fully developed people. Exactly. So yeah, genetic engineering would be expensive and thus would create even more barriers between lower and middle class people and the incredibly wealthy, which, by the way, potentially is already creating such barriers because um, there are rumors or alleged information that celebrities or extremely wealthy are already designing, genetically designing their babies. Okay, so everyone, fashion babies. Yes, exactly, designer babies. I would like to have a Chanel baby. Why not, you know? Make it way worse, exactly. Yes, Tina, brave new world, yes. Okay, literary illusions, I love that. I wonder how we make it fair. Mm -hmm. So Quinn, Actually, you made a really good point. Technically, it's not legal to genetically engineer babies, right? Um, actually, someone in China, a scientist in China, genetically engineered two twin babies with a new genetic uh, engineering technology, CRISPR-Cas, uh, to prevent them from having HIV. They induced a mutation that would make them immune to HIV. In, in very basic terms, this sounds really good, right? But the problem is um, we don't know how those twin babies will have side effects or not exactly. So we don't know if their mental capacity will be influenced by this genetic engineering because even today, we're not sure if our genetic tools as are as precise as we want them to be. Right now, when we try to edit a DNA, we edit one part and then potentially edit another part that we don't necessarily want. And this happens very frequently. So legally speaking, Quinn is right. Uh, no scientist in the world is allowed to um, ethically engineer human fetuses or human cells, right? But the problem is most countries don't have laws that state these. Usually these are scientific communities that are putting these guidelines. Some countries actually do have laws against genetic engineering, but most of them don't. So um, there is not a legal uh, obligation for scientists necessarily to stick to the ethical guidelines. I mean, there is, right? If you don't, then you're um, you won't be able to publish anywhere or you won't be able to work as a scientist, but not necessarily any legal consequences. So <laughs> exactly, Kai, those have CD bananas. <laughs> so Quinn said, we can use simulations of a person's DNA to see what might be changed. That is true. That is very true. But again, we don't know how well our tools work. So even if we did a simulation, we don't necessarily know if the enzymes that we're using to edit the DNA are working properly. Exactly, that's also another question. What if the simulations are faulty? Uh, purposes of cultivating new life only, not for improving ourselves. That's, that's I think most scientists are on that side. Uh, most scientists believe it's not a good idea to be enhancing ourselves right now. Okay. This is a really interesting discussion and I wanna keep on going, but um, I don't wanna to take too much time. I think I already have. So um, I am going to conclude my presentation.
Oh, it's not loading. Okay. I like Canva a lot for its like um, designs, but it's extremely slow because of them as well. Okay. We watched Captain America and we'll present. So guys, thank you for such an interesting discussion. I think these are really important topics we need to start thinking about because our reality is humans now know how to genetically engineer someone. And it's only a, um, it's, it's only gonna take a minute for someone to actually go ahead and do it, which as I talked about, someone did in China, although it didn't uh, result in very good things for them, but still, right? And there are alleged rumors that extremely wealthy are already doing this for their kids. So I think as a community, it's really important for us to start thinking about, is this okay? What we need to prepare as guidelines, uh, how can we make rules, ethical guidelines that everyone has to follow so we prevent such uneven distribution of um, genetic engineering, like we talked about. It will make our lives that are already hard even harder <laughs> so okay let's recap what we talked about so the first point is we can edit hereditary information of cells and in turn plants animals and humans right and we use this editing tool to prevent and treat diseases start life in exoplanets or potentially make superhumans but we just talked about this. Making superhumans is the little tricky part because there are too many ethical gray lines there. And focusing on starting new life in exoplanets or potentially understanding life in our planet better is the better focus for genetic engineering. The third, third point is a question that I want you to think about because we're going to go into a break now. Uh, for 15 minutes before Rimsha starts with her presentation and then we go into their activities. This is the question. Should we genetically edit life for other planets or enhance our robots to colonize them for us or potentially become robots ourselves to colonize exoplanets? Think about this in your break. And we're going to give another break of 15 minutes. So um, that's going to be 32, 16, 32 for me. Um, and Grimshaw is going to take over after that. I will be here um, in case you have any questions. You can just unmute yourself, ask, or I will also be reading the chat. So feel free to ask questions or engage in general. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rosa, for the wonderful presentation. Of course, thank uh, you, Rosa. Uh, students, if you have any question, please let us know in the chat. And uh, Rosa will be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Brenna. Um, I will be here and we will keep on doing activities after this. It's just that my friend is going to take over and start talking about cyborgs. But thank you guys so much. This was so much fun. Uh, I wasn't expecting for you guys to be so engaging. So thank you for that as well. And I'll see you after the break.
Okay, students, uh, we are about to start in a minute. So make sure that you're back on your seats by that time so we can, so we can start the presentation. Okay, then I guess I should start now. So hi everybody, this is Ramsha and um, today I'll be telling you about cyborgs. It's just as interesting as the name sounds. So I just hope you can stay till the end of the talk and I'm pretty sure you'll have a lot to learn, explore and as well as imagine. So let's start, start sharing my screen. So I guess it's visible. So there we go. So today I'll be talking about cyborgs. Does anybody recognize this being in the background? Yes, correct. This is Darth Vader and he is the most famous and legendary fictional cyborg character, I'd say. And um, of course, he's a legend and pretty much everybody knows about him. So let's start. So um, please go to menti.com or you could scan this QR code or you could fill out the code mentioned here and tell me about what is the first word that comes to your mind when you think about cyborgs. I'll just share the menti screen. Oh, people have started answering. I see powerful, scared, excited. Let's take a couple of minutes and wait for like at least a few responses so that we can go ahead. Okay, robot, human, human robot, unethical. Okay, that's interesting. We'll talk about this. I think I didn't mention this before, but I'm a computer science major. So, um, you know, tech savvy is my thing. We have prosthetics. Okay, lots of robot human and half human, half metal. Interesting. Okay. Um, okay, we have 
more responses. Most of them are, I guess, robot human mix. That's an interesting take. And I guess we'll talk more about this. So let's get back to the presentation. Okay, so I'll just welcome you once again. So I'm hoping all of you are excited for this fun learning session that we have planned ahead. And um, I hope you notice the little Easter eggs in the background. You'll see a lot of them throughout the slide. So make sure you don't miss any one of them, okay? So moving on. Um, do you know anything about Darth Vader or Iron Man? And what do you think you know, what do you think that makes them different from us? What's like the basic, most generic different difference that we have? You could either unmute your mic or, you know, you could just write in the chat box. Okay, they use technology to part themselves more. They are genetically, okay, they are not genetically modified because um, we will be using technology and not genetics here. So that would be a different take. Genetically modified, I think that was the entire concept the previous talk had, but this one is different. Okay, the different genomes. Okay, let's go on. So Okay, so um, these are cyborgs, right? So they are basically a combination of cybernetic and organism. So cyber from cybernetic and org from organism, that explains the roots of the words. So we call them cyborgs. Now moving on, what exactly are these cyborgs? So these are basically organisms that have enhanced abilities, okay? So these are more powerful than your average Joe. They are definitely more powerful than us and this enhancement is a result of the integration of some artificial component or like technology that makes them you know different from us and more powerful from us so um i noticed a lot of you answered prosthetic so uh, let's talk about this do you know what prosthesis is because i think a lot of you are aware what that means so it's basically an artificial uh, body part that we wear just in case we need to replace um, our arm, the leg or the foot in case of an unfortunate accident. That's what prosthesis is. Now the question is, um, do you think, hold on, I just missed the slide, no problem. <laughs> so the question is, can we consider people who use prosthetics as cyborgs? Because I saw a lot of you mention prosthetic as people who could be considered as cyborgs. So, um, you know, just to let me know what you think about this, you could go to menti.com again, use the code, or you could also scan the QR code mentioned here. So let's take a look at the responses. Okay. This is the previous one. Hold on. Yes. I guess it wouldn't be, you know, accessible before, but I guess you can do this right now. The code is mentioned. This is the previous code that we had. So, okay. I already showed the answer, my bad, but okay. So um, the answer is basically no. A person with a prosthetic body part cannot be considered as a cyborg. And I will explain the reasoning. So let's take a very simple example, okay? Imagine um, a gum sticks to the surface of your feet, right? You would feel it. You would feel that there's something on your feet and you need to get rid of that. But what happens in case of a prosthetic body part is that it only receives signals from your brain and it cannot send any signals on its own, right? Meanwhile, an actual leg, an actual human leg can do both. It can receive the signals as well as it can send the signals back. 
so that's what makes prosthetic body parts the term specifically is bionics people with prosthetic body parts are called bionics and uh, people who have you know some sort of um, technological um, upliftment i'd say some supplement that's making them stronger than the others and that part actually has the capacity to return a response they are cyborgs so um let's talk more about this so coming back here as i already mentioned the answer is no so um i would say let's watch this video it's basically this video i think might be a little um tougher for you but this has so much content that i would definitely recommend watching this again after this talk ends and they will basically explain the same concept about you know cyborgs being different from people who use prosthetics so here we go I guess there's a network issue. Thank you, Ronnie. In 1982, there was a mountain climbing accident that both of my legs had to be amputated due to tissue damage from crossfire. Here you can see my left knee. Lots of network issues. Okay. I'll just try Thanks. talking about this later. I think we had a thunderstorm today, so I guess the network is a bit off. You need to so, share. Uh, just, it, you need to share your sound from Zoom, and then we'll be able to hear it. Oh, was it not audible because uh, it it actually didn't yeah. even open because I have some network problems here. No, uh, you need to go to Zoom and then share your computer sound. Okay, hold on. I'll just stop sharing. Do the same. I guess it's. Let me know if it's audible, okay? Wow, <laughs> the network just. left me alone never mind i can just explain this talk rather or uh, i'll wait for this to load and uh, let you watch this by the end of the talk so um this guy basically explains that they are currently working on you know cyborg kind of prosthetic legs that will have the capability the capacity to naturally react to things um imagine um there's a stair right in front of you and um you don't have to think about it you just start climbing don't you because it's like a muscle memory you know when you see a stair that you need to climb it but what happens with a prosthetic leg is that your brain still needs to send those signals so that the prosthetic leg could catch it and then you know um translate those codes into uh, something that's called sensors and that's what makes them move but in case of cyborgs we'll see this whole new uh, revolution in terms of everything the world will change the way we know it imagine people being able to walk and um, run by the speed of a bullet train while not feeling a fraction of the effort that goes into it that's what cyborgs will do so um i was wondering if any of you by any chance know some real life cyborgs just in case or do you think it's possible for a real life cyborg to exist story totally possible right okay 
let's talk about this so um we'll talk about this uh i cannot take a 10 minutes break because we are running out of time so let's just skip the break and keep on going so here are some real life examples of cyborgs so first we have neil harbison as you can see there's this antenna on the top of his head doesn't this look like a disney character of some sort so let's get to the back story so this uh, guy was basically born colorblind he wasn't able to differentiate between colors like normal humans could do so what happened was that he basically had the resources to um, connect this eyeborg to his head which basically translates all the colors in the form of music we'll talk more about him in the upcoming slides i'll just give you a very short intro on these because we are definitely running short on time secondly we have dr kevin warwick he is known as the father of you know cyborg technology he had you know just imagine the worst you can imagine electrocuting yourself imagine um you know inserting a sensor by your neck imagine um installing computers you know tiny computers in your brain he has done it all and then we have professor steve man this uh headset kind of looking thing basically helps him to record audio video i mean anything in general just by thinking about it and this uh this interesting device is actually just a single piece as of right now and uh, he's currently working on it to make it more accessible so let's learn more about these people so uh, first we have neil harbison so uh, as i mentioned before he was born color blind and he has this antenna surgically implanted in the base of his skull and this was in 2004 like pretty early so i wasn't even born yet just to make sure so um in front of his forehead the antenna actually has this sensor on the tip so it basically picks these incoming lights and turns it into audio tones based on the frequency so um you know you could conclude that this guy can actually hear colors now that's something that definitely i would love to be a part of this imagine hearing colors you see green and uh, you hear um let's let me think of some musician that reminds me of green ha <laughs> green day right imagine seeing the color green and all you could hear is green day how cool would that be so um here's this interesting quote that i got from the internet is uh, with his mobile phone he can connect to nasa's international space station and perceive the colors live from space i mean this is the kind of superpower i aspire to have in the future next we have dr kevin warwick the captain cyborg um he is currently teaching at the university of reading as a cybernetics professor so warwick warwick has experimented with different electronic implants since 1998 he has installed this microchip in his arm which lets him operate lights heaters computers his uh, voice assistants anything just think about it and he can access it through these microchips that he has you know implanted in his arms the next we have professor steve man so this um he is a canadian and uh, people often call him tech crazy obviously for his invention of this headset that has these number of small computers and uh, installed all over it so basically he can record any of the audio and video just by thinking about it this headset has sensors and the sensors are actually implanted in his skull so they can um, they get the, they receive these codes from his brain and then translate them encode them in his um, headset and that's how he records all these videos and audios i wish i had this headset so that i didn't have to make notes i could just think about it and uh, i could record the entire lecture by the professor how cool would that be sadly it's still a far fetched dream so um 
it's said that he was definitely the first who experimented with wearable computing. And uh, wearable computing, and I kid you not, he started this in the 70s when people didn't even know what a computer was. Like the maximum population didn't know what a computer was, what a supercomputer was, or anything like that. But he's been experimenting through all of these technologies since his high school years. So uh, we, here we have a couple of famous fictional cyborgs. I think uh, most of you know them. Here's Darth Vader, here's Iron Man, and here's Terminator. The common thing between all uh, three of them is basically they had life in them, and as well as this uh, heavy influence of technology in their lives, which made them super powerful. So uh, here's an interesting question. What do you think about uh, sending cyborgs to space? So um, I would again request you to go to menti.com. Here's the code. And uh, you have the QR code as well. You could scan it. Yes, exactly, Kai. Um, that's what a cyborg basically is. You implant things in your system, your natural system, and uh, you just gain these superpowers, and that makes you, you know, like superhero in front of ordinary humans. Sunrises. I guess sunrises would sound like. Um, let me think of it. Something refreshing, calming at the same time. Oh, uh, so he can't take it off. I'm not really sure about this, but uh, most of these technologies usually have this function where uh, they could, you know, um, they have the implants in there, but there are removable parts that you can take it off while you sleep or you have some other functions to perform. And uh, that's how it works. Yeah, that's how he showers. He just takes the parts that are removable enough, and the, I guess the rest of them are uh, just waterproof. Okay, uh, sending cyborgs to space, it's ethical. Uh, they'll be able to survive in vacuum, uh, better adapting abilities. We could explore more needing consent, right? And they could definitely help a lot. I agree. So um, let's talk about the current problems that we have uh, while we send people to space. So the most basic problem is the biological need for oxygen. You need to breathe to stay alive, right? You need oxygen. So that's something that um, astronauts suffer a lot from because there's this uh, limited supply of resources. And that's the reason why we cannot explore um, you know, uh, space in its utmost depthness. And then there's the second part called radiation exposure. So basically, um, yearly, an average human is basically exposed to like 0.30 REM of radiation, while an astronaut aboard on the International Space Station for 90 days is exposed for nine. That's a lot. Does anybody know about Chernobyl? Um, it was a drastic incident that took place in Ukraine in the late 70s. And um, it could have changed humanity forever if it wasn't prevented. And um, we could all be born with, you know, like non-functional parts. I could have a hand hanging over here or my eyes could be down below or uh, my nose could be upside down. Just imagine, it would be chaotic everywhere. Um, 
so we prevented the disaster thanks to robots and everything but what if we had a cyborg imagine if we had a cyborg we could basically send them there because they would have these um inbuilt resources that could help them fight radiation and uh, they could just easily cover up the core without too much of effort so uh, what can we expect when we send a cyborg to space so there's this theory that was proposed by manfred and nathan which aimed at tackling this problem we will uh, right now we'll be talking about the breathing problem so uh, these two scientists basically theorized that um, we can make this fuel cell inside us we can install this that would basically be capable of reducing reducing co2 to its components so with the removal of carbon and recirculation of oxygen breathing would become unnecessary and uh, imagine if you had this power of you know not recording oxygen you has the, you have this system installed inside of you which makes oxygen on its own you could travel anywhere you want i mean that's like the biggest problem that the astronauts currently face they don't have enough space enough resources to go on missions more farther away we have this limited distance that we can cover um by utilizing the resources we currently have but the solution to this problem would be cyborgs so um cyborgs can basically revolutionize space travel um we can also reduce their metabolic functions with existing medical procedures and that would definitely include installing something inside of them so so far many experiments have uh, resulted in patients being in torpor state for one week so let's discuss about torpor state i hope uh, many of you know about the movie interstellar they based the people on the crew went to a deep sleep for this good amount of time now time is another controversial aspect that i wouldn't want to cover right now or i would surely love to but we are really running out of time so let's just think about this that um the time he spent in space he didn't age but his daughter who was on earth was on her deathbed and um they managed to space travel because of the torpor state they had this function where they could um reduce their metabolic functions they went into a uh, some some sort of um hibernation i would say and that helped them explore wormholes and like what not so um i want you to imagine oh sh- why is this up <laughs> i want you to imagine the possibilities like what comes up in your mind when you think about sending cyborgs to space um after the discussion we had imagine a system that could help you breathe imagine a system that could help prevent radiation affecting you imagine a system where you could be in deep sleep and you wouldn't need basic things like food or um, or just <laughs> food or just you know just anything to exist you could just be in a deep sleep for years and you could reach your destination while saving the resources the world will change so um once we have cyborgs in the palm of our hands we can travel space way deeper so i hope you all know who stephen hawking is so once he mentioned that um life on earth is is definitely not something that you can predict imagine a nuclear disaster imagine an uh, urgent need urgent disaster of climate change or anything that ends life on earth so life on earth isn't guaranteed what we need to do what we need to do for surviving is that we need to travel we need to get to the space we need to explore more planets so i in my opinion cyborgs would basically be the first step for humans to become a multi planet species imagine living on mars jupiter neptune or whatever your favorite planet is life would be so cool we could be uh, going on for a summer vacation to another planet 
we could be having a school picnic to Pluto, or uh, we could be enjoying um, our break in an asteroid. You know, the possibilities are endless. Once we start thinking, there's no end to the imagination. So um, here's the next part. Any questions that you might have, you can easily unmute yourself and let me know. Yes, Christo, uh, I know about this, but the problem is it's not yet proved. Um, it's illegal in almost 70% of the world. There was this uh, drama made, I believe. Uh, there was a K-drama, I believe, uh, that covered this. And uh, it was basically an experiment. And they went to sleep for like 20 years. And the problem was what when they woke up, they had this temperature requirement that they had to fulfill for being alive because they were in this frozen for so long that their body adapted to it. So we don't know what this could bring to us. So that's why it's still not possible. And uh, when we talk about cyborgs, uh, there's this huge possibility that the disaster side would be decreased to a great extent. We could think of just, you know, implanting something and uh, staying alive, and it doesn't have any negative repercussions to it. Uh, so we need to figure out our way to get that temperature. I mean, we need to figure a way to get that temperature, but that's like the only, uh, only disadvantage that they mention. The disadvantages could be numerous. Maybe your skin uh, might start melting if it comes in the, re uh, in, you know, directly in the sunlight. Uh, you could have these um, varying sugar levels when you travel. So yeah, cyborgs aren't in the, uh, indestructible, I know. But the thing is that cyborgs aren't gods. They are just enhanced version of us humans. So what we are talking about here is basically enhancing our capabilities, exploring regions we haven't been able to explore as of right now in our current resources. So um, when you think about technology, almost anything is possible. Imagine, um, imagine telling your grandma's grandma that you are able to talk to the other person, to a person on the other side of the globe while not meeting them. Mobile phones. I don't think anybody in uh, the 18th century or the 17th century would believe that this is possible. Right? So the thing about technology is that they don't actually have a limit. There's so much to explore. And uh, in my point of view, I believe that computer science is the nearest thing to technology. Oh, is the nearest thing to magic. The closest thing to magic is definitely computer science. Because um, I don't think people felt the possibilities you know, flying cars, airplanes, us uh, uh, like tons of steel flying in the air. How is that possible for people living in the 18th century again? I'm just using them as a reference because imagine the possibilities, the life that we live right now and the life that they lived are so drastically different. So cyborgs are basically something that can revolutionize the way we live. Implanting technology in humans and using it for the better. It would be so cool. Yes, we will be the ultimate species. No doubt in that. So um, I would now request Rosa to share the fun activity that we have planned. Um, Rimsha, do you mind sharing your screen? Oh, uh, yes, definitely. If you have charts, thank you. Okay. I've been reading the um, chat the entire time. You guys are so funny. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So since we covered the questions, now we I think we have another hour. And we of course, we don't want to keep you here for the entirety of the hour. And you need some time before you go into the next lecture and stuff like that. So we're going to do a quick fun activity before we leave. 
you're you're part of a team an hour am i wrong okay i i could be wrong uh rabia do you am i wrong i think she's not here sorry rosa what did you say so how much do we how much time do we have left I think we ha we have like uh, more 25 minutes. 25 minutes. I'm okay. Wrong. Because I keep confusing the Pacific standard time. Uh, okay. So everyone says the time should be up by now. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the hour, I was confused as well. So maybe I'm mixing the Pacific standard time. Um, in that case yeah 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 i think it's over because uh, it's been two hours yeah thank yes, you guys it's been two hours it's been two hours <laughs> thank you guys but if they have time and if they want to stay you know no 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 um you guys can leave i'm just gonna give you a quick exercise for you to um do by by yourself alone in your free time and um i guess we'll be here for another 10 minutes if you have extra questions after that so before you leave we just want you to think that you're part of a genetic and robotics engineer team, okay? We, uh, we are gonna give you a task. Your task is designing a cyborg slash human that can travel to space, that can survive in space. Your goal is to design such a species of, sorry, Rumsha. Um, your goal is to design a species that can survive outside of the earth with minimum equipment, okay? Think about that. And um, when you're thinking about that yeah, potential species. Sorry, say, uh, say it again, Weston. Turn them into tardigrade. Yeah, <laughs> you guys already know. You guys already know what survives. Um, and, you know, keep in mind that it needs to survive, it needs to reproduce, and um, it doesn't have an atmosphere, okay? Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was really fun interacting with you guys. You guys are amazing. And I hope uh, you come up with an organism yourself. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, thank Erna, you. Uh, Vicky, and everyone else for helping in the chat.